Chapter 3 Bright sunlight was streaming through the window. Sterling groaned and squinted into the light. Her nose was frozen, a drip of moisture hanging from the end. Quickly, she wiped it away. Not that she was trying to impress Jake Ramsley. If anything, she was going to be persona non grata after she published the photos that she had taken. Speaking of which, a picture of the inside of the cockpit before they took away the blanket in front of the door would look great. She could see the headlines now. Billionaire stranded on side of mountain. Billionaire to survive due to the ingenuity of flight attendant. Plane crash claims life of pilot. Jake Ramsley still alive. Any one of those would be a seller for the tabloids. Ray Grange, eat your heart out. Her boss would be enthusiastic about the piece. Problem was, if she did not have reception, she could not send any articles. Sterling also would need to find time away from Jake Ramsley to write. There were so many things in the mix right now that she needed to work on. David's release, Michael's arrest, and the family's opinion of that, Ted's death, and now Jake being stuck on a mountain. It really was amazing how one family could have such bad luck. Her good luck was that she could write about it and had an interested audience. Sterling took a peek at Jake. He was still sleeping. At least he was breathing. The last thing she wanted was to explain how a billionaire had died under her care. Those would be bad headlines. Turning her phone on, Sterling edged it out of the blanket and took a quick picture before looking for a signal. Nothing. Then again, had 911 rolled out a new texting program? Sterling did not think it was available in all areas, but she was willing to give it a shot. She remembered learning somewhere that text was less strenuous on signal strength than an actual phone call. First, she dialed 911. No signal was the phone's response. Then, she tried to text. Sterling had never done this before, so she did not know if a person was supposed to just send it to 911, or if there were letters or anything. Figuring it could only not work, she texted as much as she knew about their situation. Plane 9089, out of New Haven Airport, crashed in Mountain. Unknown location. Pilot dead. Passenger and crew okay. Need rescue ASAP. Hitting send, Sterling had a little prayer that the text would find its way to the right people. Any luck? Jake asked sleepily, running a hand through his hair. No man had any right to look that good just waking up. Sterling knew her makeup was going to be smeared all over and that she would have wild hair and raccoon eyes. Her breath probably did not smell all that wonderful either. No, the text message is not even sending. Who did you text? Jake frowned. He did that far too often in Sterling's limited exposure to him. She wondered what it would take to make the man happy. Probably data sheets that added up perfectly. 911? Sterling shut off her phone and put it away. Her fingers were getting cold. Is that a thing? Texting 911? He asked. She shrugged. I thought I read somewhere that some countries are now making texting 911 available. I thought it would not hurt to try. True, Jake slowly agreed. I suppose we should see what our situation is by the light of day. He sat up and took all the warmth of the blanket with him. Sterling scowled as she quickly sat up. She grabbed the blanket from the floor and wrapped it around herself as he began peeling the tape away from the frame of the cockpit door. Bright light hit their eyes from the winter wonderland outside. It was white and snowy with green pines. It looked like a holiday postcard, except for the fact that neither of them were properly dressed for the occasion. Sterling huddled in her blanket, trying to ignore the call of nature. Now she bitterly regretted those two glasses of wine. Jake stepped through the doorway and gave a low whistle. What? Scrambling to her feet, Sterling followed him. It's a long way down, Jake grimaced. Did I mention I hate climbing trees? Well, be thankful you don't need to do it in a skirt. Sterling looked over the edge. The nose of the plane was wedged on a rock face. Unfortunately, it looked like their best bet was to climb down one of the nearest pine trees. It did not look like they would be able to reach the rock as the plane was just slightly over the edge. Sterling stepped back, her stomach queasy at the drop. 
Thankfully, their combined weight had not caused the plane to move an inch. Otherwise, they might be pumbling down the hillside right now. How was she supposed to climb down a tree in a skirt and pumps? In her search of the remaining cupboards, Sterling had not found anything useful that she could swap out her flight attendant clothes for. She had a bad feeling they were in deep trouble. Jake did not look much better equipped than she was. He had loafers and dress pants on. Both of them were going to court frostbite come the approaching nightfall when things cooled off considerably. Right now, with the sun and hardly any breeze, it was somewhat tolerable. Still cold, but Sterling thought if she could just get proper shoes and pants, she might be okay. Tonight, however, that was going to be a different story. Without adequate shelter, they probably would freeze on the side of the mountain. Jake Ramsley, billionaire and America's most eligible bachelor, dies on mountain. Oh, and so does tabloid reporter. Wonderful. Or better yet, she chased them to their deaths. America mourns Jake Ramsley. Grange would make her out to be some delusional idiot. Sterling wondered what they were going to do. I have an idea, Jake suddenly spoke. Come on. He led the way back to the cockpit. Sterling followed him. She watched while he spread his blanket on the floor. We cannot go back to sleep and pretend it was all a bad dream and hope that we'll wake up someplace else, Sterling said dryly. I've already tried. It didn't work. That is not what I'm doing. Jake pointed to the blanket. If you sit there, I can cut out of a sort of pat patterns out of the blanket. We can use the tape to secure it, and you'll be warmer than just a skirt. Can we make some socks, too? Sterling went for the blanket. We can try. Jake shrugged. He pulled out a set of keys and picked one. Jake used the key on the blanket to punch through and tear it. They taped up the seams with packing tape. What about the waist? wondered Sterling. Is it going to fall down? Tape? Jake held up the roll. And when I need to do my personal business? She raised an eyebrow. Her bladder already was protesting at the delay. Jake frowned. Does your skirt have a belt? If it does, we can tape it to the pants and you'll be able to keep them up that way. It won't be pretty, but it would work. Sterling undid the belt on her skirt. She helped position it while Jake taped it to the shiny material. I am going to make every disco club person jealous. Funny. Jake gave her a smile and took Sterling's breath away. Oh, dear. Craggy had turned into handsome, just with a smile, Sterling thought with surprise. Maybe we'll get lucky and the rescue people will see the sun reflecting off your legs. Dual-purpose pants! We should patent these babies. Sterling briefly debated whether to put her skirt over top or to tuck it into the pants. Without the belt, it might fall down, so she decided to tuck. It probably would not look sexy. Sexy was not her goal, Sterling sternly reminded herself. Getting to safety was. She could get all glamorous off the check her boss was going to give her once she submitted her latest articles. Somehow I'm not sure they would be too popular. Jake grinned at her transformation. What? You don't like the model that comes with padding in the rear? Sterling shrugged. Socks, please. Coming right up, said Jake. A few mistakes and tries later, they came up with an acceptable prototype for socks. The good news was that Sterling's feet still fit in the pumps. The bad news was that they were very tight. It had to be better than not having socks at all. At least, she hoped so. Jake taped the bottom of the pants to the socks so that no snow would come in. They folded up the remains of the tattered blanket, taking it and the tape with, in case any repairs might be needed. Sterling folded and stuffed her blanket down her shirt so that she would have both hands free. Jake did the same. Okay, ready to make a jailbreak? Sterling questioned as she grabbed the nearly empty water bottle that had been in the cockpit. They would need water and something to carry it in. It looked like this was all they currently had, so Sterling was going to take it with. She popped it in her blouse as well, wincing at the cold. I think so. Jake looked out at the tree. I wish we did not have to climb down a tree to do it. Only one option. She limped past him and carefully lowered herself to sit on the plain floor near the pine. What is that? Jake asked curiously. We keep going until we find shelter or rescue. Sterling thought it was fairly clear. 
Otherwise, we die. One option, he agreed grimly. Crouching at the opening, Jake helped Sterling find a grip on the tree so that she could start her descent. Hopefully, they would not dislodge anything and cause the nose of the plane to come crashing down on either of them. Branches scraped her face and hands as she carefully found her way down the trunk of the large pine. Sterling breathed a sigh of relief as her feet touched the ground and she was able to make her way out from under the tree. She looked up to see if Jake had already started to climb down. Sterling shadowed her eyes with her hand, but could not see him. Over the edge of the rock face, it looked like the plane was hanging off by nearly a third of the nose. They were so lucky it had not moved. Sterling was tempted to call up to Jake. Then she realized if she yelled, it might set off an avalanche. That would be the worst thing that could happen to them right now. Instead, she swallowed anything she might have been going to say and waited patiently for him to descend the tree. Her toes were already numb, either from cold or from the lack of the ability to move. Her pants were actually warm. Sterling blessed Jake silently for thinking of making them. The tree shook a little under his weight as Jake made his way to the ground. A few moments later, he emerged from the branches, dusting off his suit jacket. Ready? No. Sterling shook her head. Remember when I talked about doing my business? I'm going to find a convenient tree. I'll be back in a bit. You sound like you've been camping before. Jake thought he should find a tree himself. More like bush parties? She shrugged as she walked away. Meet you back here. Sure thing. Jake went in the opposite direction. The good news is that it was not snowing. When he was done, he followed his tracks back to the tree where they had climbed down from the plane. I hope you like to walk. Sterling was plowing through the snow as she returned. It was up to her knees. We should probably take turns going first, Jake said as he fell into step behind her. She walked past. That way we'll not tire out as easily. Okay, Sterling puffed. It was not easy going. The elevation was not helping either. I think going downhill would probably be the best since we have no idea where we are. Maybe we'll find a road, Jake offered some hope. They trudged along for hours, taking sips from the water then putting snow in it to melt with their body heat. It was bright and sunny. They saw no one, not even any wildlife besides the birds singing to them. I need a rest, Sterling finally gave in. She leaned against an old stump, puffing. Jake handed her the water bottle. He looked around the clearing. I think this might be an old logging road. What do you mean? Sterling looked around. There are a lot of stumps in the clearing. Then there's clear way between those trees at the end, he pointed. I think that might be an old logging road. If we follow it, we might come to a real road. Sterling smiled in appreciation. With real people, in real cars, who will give us a lift to the nearest town. Shall we give it a try? asked Jake. Beats walking through the trees, she agreed. How are your knee and feet? He took the offered water bottle back, drinking the rest and stuffing it with more snow. It was not efficient, but it was all they had until they found a stream or other source of water. Knee hurts, but that's to be expected. Sterling shrugged. My feet are completely numb. Whether it's from the cold or the too tight shoes, I don't know. Jake frowned. His feet were cold, but not numb. Maybe we should rub them to help with the circulation. We don't have time. She pointed to the sun, which was slowly making its way across the sky. Sterling got up from the stump and began walking again. We need to find shelter or rescue before tonight, or we'll end up freezing. Jake realized the wisdom in what she said, even if he did not like the idea of her getting frostbite or worse from the cold. He would make sure that his turns pushing through the snow lasted longer than hers, since Sterling was starting to tire as the afternoon wore on. How long have you been a flight attendant? he asked in an effort to make time seem to go faster as they walked. Not long, admitted Sterling. It was something I sort of fell into. Not your dream job? questioned Jake. No. Sterling had a half laugh. What about you? What do you do? I head up the Western Division of Ramsley Insurance, Jake automatically replied. We provide insurance for large businesses. How long have you worked in insurance? 
Sterling knew the answer, but decided to ask it anyways. Since college, supplied Jake. It was something I was expected to do. So not your dream job either, she asked dryly. No. Jake frowned and looked at the snow at his feet. He crouched down and cleared away the white stuff to find gravel. It is a road. Oh, good. Sterling was relieved. This meant that they were making progress. Hopefully they would find some civilization soon. She was so hungry. If you were not in insurance, what would you do? What do you mean? Jake frowned as he resumed, following her. What is your dream job? she inquired. I don't know. How can you not know? Sterling stopped to look at him. Everyone has a secret wish that they were doing something else. What would your wish be? I don't know. Jake shrugged as he passed her and began plowing through the snow. I suppose I never let myself think of it. There's not really a point, since I knew I was expected to follow in my father's footsteps. At some point, he'll be ready to step down as head of the company, and I'll be expected to take his place. How boring. Sterling hurried after him. You will never realize your true potential, all because of family expectations. What about you? What would you be doing if you're not a flight attendant? He returned the question. What is your dream job? I would love to be a writer. Sterling said easily. I used to want to be a gritty news journalist, going to other countries to discover the truth and write about it to the American people. What happened? What stopped you from being a journalist? Jake asked, truly curious. There is a surplus of journalists since the digital age has reduced newspaper readership. Also, most newspapers and online columns are syndicated. That means they only need a handful of people to write, shrugged Sterling. It was a difficult job market. I didn't make the cut. Now you fly to other countries while serving the American people on airplanes. Jake did not think it would really compare. My next move is to try to write and publish a book. Sterling did not know why she was admitting her goal. She supposed Jake was too easy to talk to. What about? inquired Jake. Maybe about my life experiences, she admitted. Or maybe just a work of fiction. People say I have a flair for the dramatic. It could be fun, and with the indie market exploding, I don't even have to worry about going through a traditional publisher if I don't want to. Indie market? Jake questioned. Independent market. Individual people publish, market, and sell on their own terms with the help of different digital platforms. Sterling had been researching the idea more and more lately. However, right now the tabloid paid the bills. Which meant she should be questioning Jake not the other way around. Sometimes they say that you should turn your vacation into your vocation, Sterling remarked, since you don't know what your dream job would be. What do you enjoy doing? Jake shrugged. I golf, mostly that is a networking tool for business. What else? wondered Sterling. How dull if all he did was business and golfing. I like to cook, Jake confessed. Like barbecue or boil some soup? She puffed as she tried to keep up to his long strides. Sterling was not exactly in the worst shape. She did do a lot of cardio, running after people and sources. However, she also enjoyed a little junk food, she had to admit. Like full-on know-my-way-around-a-kitchen cook, he clarified. I've taken classes when I have time. I make a mean brownie. Brownies. Just the word made her mouth salivate. I always thought it would be neat to go on one of those cooking shows on the cooking channel, Jake mused. You mean like Rachel Ray or Martha Stewart? Sterling frowned. He did not seem the type for that. No, I was thinking more like Beat Bobby Flay or Iron Chef. His hands started moving as he talked, and Sterling had the inkling that when he got excited over something, he emphasized his talking with gestures. That would be cool. Cool indeed, agreed Sterling. She did not cook, nor did she see the fun in it. However, she did enjoy eating, so if he liked making brownies, she'd be happy to sample them, or anything else, since she was generally hungry. Not that she was ever going to see Jake Ramsley after they managed to get off this mountain. Sterling took out her phone, snapping a quick photo of Jake as he walked through the snow. She held the cell up and prayed for a signal. Wait, I think I have a bar! 
Jake practically ran back to her as Sterling dialed 911 and pressed to connect the call. No service. How can that be? There was a bar on the screen, Jake growled as he pointed to the clearly defined bar. I'll try texting 911 again. Sterling tried to resend the previous message of them being missing. She added on that they were now walking down a logging road and pressed send. Incorrect number. Unable to send message. The phone screen flashed back. Sterling looked at Jake. What now? Maybe we can send a text to someone else, suggested Jake. They can tell the police what we send to them. Good idea. She texted her brother, Brant. Brant generally texted her back within a couple hours, so he would be good to send an emergency text to. Or Sterling tried to text him. The shattered corner of the screen would not let her access her contact list. It's broken. Can you put in the number manually? questioned Jake. Sterling brought up the keyboard function and began to put in the phone number. The numbers on the screen skipped as the cell phone did not acknowledge two, five, or a six. Who do we know that does not have a two, five, or six in their phone number? Sterling said in frustration. The screen was cracked, but yesterday the phone had worked perfectly. Now it appeared the damage had progressed. They both began going through various numbers of people they knew, ruling out almost everyone from business associates to friends and family. It did not help that due to the phone keeping all the numbers in a contact list, neither of them really had many full phone numbers that they could recall offhand. Wait, I think I've got one. Jake had been writing his numbers in the snow, trying to find one. Try 317-907-8070. Who is that? Sterling asked as she punched in the number. My cousin Max, Jake replied. He came to peer over Sterling's shoulder as she began to furiously text. At least I think that is his number. Not all the text letters worked either. It was working yesterday, she wailed in frustration. Okay, we can figure out a simple message without whatever letters that are not working, Jake assured her. It took them a good twenty minutes. Phone 911. J.R. and S.H. S.T.R.N.D.E.D. on M.T. dot P.L.N.E. C.R.S. H.E.D. Get cops, follow phone. Maybe we should replace PLNE with flight? Sterling asked doubtfully. The G does not work, remember? Jake frowned at the screen. Maybe just delete that and leave the crashed part? Okay. She got rid of the unnecessary word and sent it. They both waited to see what the phone would say. Message sent. Jake had a sigh of relief. Yes! Sterling grabbed him in a hug. We are going to get rescued. Ouch! Jake gasped. She quickly let him go. Sorry. It's okay. Jake assured her with a pained expression while he held his aching ribs with both hands pressed against his chest. He drew in a few shallow breaths. I am so sorry. Sterling apologized again. No worries. Jake put a hand on her shoulder. We should keep walking. Like you said, they still need to find us. Sterling nodded and allowed him to lead them onward through the snow. They walked for hours, taking small breaks and getting thirstier. Near sunset, there was a small stream that was flowing. Jake filled up the bottle several times, and both were able to drink their fill, then refill the bottle again. It was well into dark when they found the shack on the side of the road. Sterling stumbled into Jake as he aimed the flashlight at the tiny cabin that looked like it was held together by whatever materials had been handy at the time someone was doing each repair. It looks like the home of a serial killer. Sterling grabbed Jake's sleeve. It looks like home for the night and hopefully it has food and a stove. Jake went up to the door and found that it was not locked. We are in luck. Sterling was not so certain. She cautiously followed Jake into the small space, shutting the door behind her. Jake shone the flashlight around, showing off a small cot along one wall, a shelf with canned goods, a desk with all sorts of paperwork on it, a single chair, and a tiny stove with wood nearby. Thank you, Jake said emphatically. Whoever you are that set this up, thank you. 
Sterling was about to agree when something swooped at her, brushing her face. She clutched Jake's arm and screamed. Jake jumped. What is wrong with you? There is something in here. Sterling wondered if it was the ghost of the former owner. A shiver racked her frame. She hoped he was a nice ghost and was not mean or creepy. It is just us in here. Jake rolled his eyes and looked on the shelf for matches. We are in business. Sterling carefully took the blanket out from her blouse, setting the shimmering fabric on the cot. I am telling you, something touched my face. Sarah, nothing is in here, Jake repeated as he shoved some wood into the stove. Are you supposed to use the large bits? Wouldn't the small bits catch fire easier? asked Sterling. She had seen her brother and father create fires often enough, and they did not do it the way Jake did. How about you see if you can find a can opener while I get the fire going? Jake ignored Sterling and lit a match to try to start the fire. Sterling scowled at him. Leave it to a man to go all caveman in a desperate situation. It was obvious he had no clue how to start a fire. And ordering her to find the can opener? How sexist was that? Especially when he had said that he was the one who liked to cook. Fine. He thought she was delusional and incapable of anything but the most basic womanly thing of opening a tin can. Yet if that stupid spider, or whatever that thing was that touched her one more time, she would— Ah! The can opener went flying from Sterling's hand, causing Jake to duck. Or maybe it was the winged creature that went flying for him. There is a bat in the shack! What on earth? Jake slowly stood up, and they both looked for the bat. Here! Sterling threw a blanket at Jake. Catch it with this. Catch it? Jake looked at Sterling like she had lost her mind. What am I supposed to do with it? Put it outside? She explained, ducking down as it swooped over her head again. That's what my father would always do. I'm going to risk rabies just to put a bat outside? Jake asked incredulously. What else are you going to do with it? Kill it? Bats are good for the environment. They eat mosquitoes. Sterling stayed in a crouch, despite the fact that her knee was adamantly protesting the treatment. And I am not going to sleep in here with it flying around. You get rid of it, protested Jake. You seem to know what you're doing. Be a man, Sterling shot back at him, conveniently ignoring that she had been trashing him in her head for going all macho a minute ago. I told you already, I hate camping and everything about nature. Jake glared at her. Suck it up, she replied without any sympathy. You're starting the fire wrong anyways. Get the bat, and I'll get us a blazing fire in a little stove on which you can cook dinner to your heart's content. Fine, Jake stopped and stared at her. Stay still. What? Sterling paused, her hand coming automatically halfway to her head before stopping. She turned fearful eyes to Jake. Is he in my hair? Please say he is not in my hair. Adjusting his hold on the blanket, Jake carefully stood on the cot. He slowly maneuvered himself into the right position and then pounced at a corner of the ceiling. Aha! Did you get him? Sterling used the desk to get back to her feet. Get the door before he bites me or something, Jake ordered as he stepped off the cot. She limped to the door, flinging it open. The hinges squeaked in protest. I'll shut the door behind you so he does not fly back in. What am I supposed to do? Let him take revenge on me for evicting him? Jake stood in the doorway. I am not going to be outside letting him attack me as soon as he is free. He won't attack you. He'll just fly away. Sterling certainly hoped so. The last thing she wanted was for the bat to return inside the shack. How do you know? For throwing him outside into the cold to die, Jake said sarcastically. I would be upset if someone did that to me. First of all, he does not reason like a human. He's probably going to be happy to get free, Sterling retorted. Secondly, maybe he has another little cozy home he can go to. Some place he does not have to share. Or maybe he has a relative he can room with until we leave. Whatever, it is his problem. I am not going outside, Jake reiterated. Fine. Sterling grabbed the door, leaving it open just a small piece. 
put your hands and the bat outside, and when you let him go, pull your hands in quick and I'll shut the door. Do not smash my fingers. I need them, he warned. I will try not to, Sterling rolled her eyes. He needed them for all those data reports he liked to study and type up. Ready? he asked. At Sterling's nod, he released the bat and pulled his hands into the tiny cabin, leaving the blanket in the snow outside. She closed the door quickly. They waited for a moment. Do you think he's gone? Well, I don't hear any minute knocks on the door. Sterling looked at Jake. Are you going to get the blanket? Not for a little while. I'd rather wait until he's gone for certain, Jake said firmly. Thought you were going to start a fire since you know all about building one. I am, Sterling smoothly remarked. She limped over to the stove. Your knee is getting worse, Jake remarked with a frown. How are the ribs? She pulled out large chunks of wood that he had placed in the tiny stove and began building a proper little pyramid with small sticks, paper, and shavings. Lighting a match, the kindling caught. Sterling gently blew on the flames until they grew and then added more sticks. Sore? Jake retrieved the can opener from the ground with a grimace. They're worse when I have to bend over or stretch. Sterling frowned as she added a couple larger pieces, then shut the door of the stove. Should we tape your ribs? I thought the doctors advised against doing that any more, Jake murmured as he perused what was available in the meager supply of canned and dry goods. Well, except for the packing tape, we don't have anything proper to bind you with anyways, shrugged Sterling. The stove is all yours, chef. Excellent. Jake selected a can, opening it. Do not expect gourmet. I'll be lucky if I don't burn anything on that stove. Sterling sat down on the cot, holding her frozen hands toward the fledging heat of the stove. I am so hungry right now, I don't care if it was burnt. We should probably pack your knee in ice, Jake commented as he looked around the small space. There are no plates. I guess we eat it out of the pan, Sterling suggested. She did not feel like moving to put ice on her leg. Hours of walking had exhausted her. There is cutlery, but no pan either. Jake frowned and peeled off the can's label. I guess we eat right out of the tin. He set three cans on the stove and then kneeled in front of Sterling. What are you doing? she asked tiredly. Taking off your shoes? Jake peeled back the silver blanket socks that they had made. Your skin is a little blue. Sterling moaned as the heat from the fire started to penetrate, and Jake began massaging her feet. At first it was a little painful, and then enjoyable. She leaned back and closed her eyes. Don't fall asleep just yet, Jake warned. Supper is almost ready. We could melt snow on the stove and those cans afterward, Sterling mused. She needed to get a picture of this place. Ramsley and flight attendant overnight in a tiny logging shed. Her boss would expect another line tacked on, like, did they or didn't they? Well, they did not. They were far too exhausted from slogging through the snow. Not that Jake Ramsley was not fine in his own way, but they were too tired, too sore, and too hungry to think about intimate relations. It is hot, Jake mildly warned, as she accepted a can of beans and a spoon from him. Jake sat beside her as they each ate from their cans. What do you have? asked Sterling. Carrots, shrugged Jake. We can switch halfway if you'd like. Sure. Sterling was not feeling too picky at this point. He could have said he was eating sauerkraut, and she probably would have eaten a few spoonfuls before giving up. She was not a fan of kraut. The other can is beef stew. Jake pointed his spoon at the stove. I figure we will split it. Then, if we're still hungry, I saw a can of peaches on the shelf. Peaches, breathed Sterling. It was a feast, in her opinion. They sat in companionable silence while they ate. Between the two of them, they managed to finish off all four cans of food before giving up. Jake retrieved the blanket. Sterling stroked the stove, and they settled in for the night. If you enjoyed this chapter of Stranded with the Billionaire, book six of the Ramsley Brothers series, look for chapter four. You can also find the books on Amazon. Just look up Stranded with the Billionaire or the Ramsley Brothers by Josephine Bintema. Happy reading!